Okay, so we are in Acts chapter 4, and uh, the plan is to wrap up the last couple of verses here, and um, forgive me, you'll notice I'm standing this morning as uh, my allergies and just uh, have been doing well, have been feeling great, and uh, when I sit down, my it just seems to get more congested and blocked up, so I'm going to try to stand as much as possible today. Um, <clears throat> Acts chapter 4, we've been coming through really uh, Peter's second sermon. Right? We've seen a couple sermons been preached by Peter here, uh, one of the day of Pentecost, one after that in the temple, after he and John, uh, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit, were able to raise a lame man to, to heal him miraculously. And in all these things, remember, God is just providing a platform, right? Uh, and, and uh, you know, providing a pulpit, if you will, for, for Peter and John and for these disciples to preach and teach the gospel and, and spread that. And so really that's what we're seeing in the, in the beginning of Acts here, right, is, is um, the beginning of the, the New Testament church. And so we see it's, it's starting to spread. And, and uh, you know, we're going to see how God continues to do that through the rest of our, our study here. But what are some thoughts maybe uh, you guys uh, give some input as, as to a little bit of review here before we, we're going to pick up in verse 32 uh, and finish the rest of the, of the chapter here. But what are some thoughts maybe that y'all have on uh, chapter 4 before that or last week or, or any of the prior weeks? Um, what, do, what do you guys think about? Well, definitely uh, John and Peter are, are definitely, you know, under the Holy Spirit, they're definitely leaders <coughs> and, uh, you know, I think a lot of when uh, when Christ asked Peter who he was, that you know God revealed it to him. So you know Peter has you know all the assurance and John of course, and they're just you know they're confronting they're 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 Jewish men, uneducated, but they are confronting all the Jewish leaders. I mean it's a lot. To, you know, yeah. These guys are really in a role. Yeah. So, Good. So Joe just brought up kind of what we saw maybe in the middle to the latter part of chapter 4 here the last couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, that they've been confronted now, right? Peter and John have been confronted uh, by the religious leaders <clears throat> and, and really threatened also, right? What, what happened? Yeah, remember? Yeah, put in jail. Yeah, they got put in jail and holding for the night, and then they brought them out the next morning, and, uh, and they warned them, right? Don't, don't teach anymore in, in this name, in the name of Jesus, and... Um, and what was what was their reaction to that, you guys? They can't not. Yeah, they follow they God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, can't but listen. not do this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like they're gonna really listen to him. Yeah. But I think a lot of people would, right? A lot of people do. A lot when you get threatened. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people would Fear. shut down and be like, "Oh, okay, you know, it's uh, I better I better watch it." And certainly, I think there's gonna be times of discernment. You know, when yeah, you but I think it's like a relationship. It's like you know, if you've ever had. A re- an ex-boyfriend, I don't know, where you try to turn off feelings or something, it's like you can't just turn on and off something that you know so well or something there's, some, you know, so that on and off thing, like even if you wanted to, you can't turn it on and off like that. That's also your salvation. Like you don't get to forget everything that you've learned and what Christ has done for you. You don't just turn that off, it's, you know. And yeah. You can't well, just snap it on and off. You're compelled, yeah. you know. That's the word that I really like. And you know, they're that, compelled to speak. To add to that is that uh, this was, uh, I'm not going to say the beginning because I know every time I say the beginning, you told me the church was in the wilderness. But it's the, the what do you call it, the passing on the baton, you know? Mm-hmm. The, you remember now is when everything is, you know, the, the Pentecost came, the spirit that was fulfilled. So now it's like, you know, on a roll that, you know, <coughs> you, can't, you can't compromise. It is not compromised at all. Well, and I think I remember just a lot from Acts 2 of just seeing their example. And I think all through here is an example of, you know, how the church was, but also in yeah. these examples of, you know, when do you stand up and fight? When do you, you know, just just good examples of yep. what the church should look like and what a Christian should look like. What the like. leader should look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jen? It's made me think I was, I'm reading Jeremiah, and yesterday I read in chapter 20 where he's, clearly frustrated and downhearted because mm-hmm. of all he's all the persecution and he says uh, I proclaim violence and destruction because the word of the Lord has resulted in taunting and derision all day long but if I say I will not remember him nor speak anymore in his name 
then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire. Yes, <laughs> like, I love that. I cannot hold it in. Right? Yes, I love that. That's uh, Jeremiah 29, right? 20 verse 9? 20, yep. Yeah, okay. I've got that uh, written here on the side of my Bible too because I, I love that. In uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 16, I've got there too, just reference in my Bible, and I know that one, that's um, where Paul is kind of saying the same thing, which, you know, at this point, Paul hasn't been saved yet, right? But later in Acts, when we, when we meet Paul and we see Paul, um, you know, after that, he writes 1 Corinthians in chapter 9. He says, um, you know, uh, that uh, I'm compelled. He says that I'm under compulsion to do this. And he says, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but I like it that it's like something they can't even correct. suppress. Right. It's not that they're making themselves overcome yeah, 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 fear. Yeah, yeah. It's correct. It's right. pouring that. out of them. Not right. I'm not there. <laughs> I yeah. like to be there. Yeah, yeah we have... A lot of us have talked about that, whether it's, you know, pastors, you, you hear us say that, and I've made those comments to Brian, you know, before. Like, you just, you do, you do still, you know, and God gives different people gifts. And so, you you know, most preachers and teachers, like, want to teach and preach, you know. Um, but like you said, it's, it's different, too, in, in all of us to, what about evangelizing and talking to my neighbor, you know what I mean, or doing this, uh, talking to my, my family or the garden people or... Uh, you know, like I said, that, that fire and that um, compulsion, um, you know, that, uh, that the Holy Spirit can bring upon us for sure. And uh, I think this is a good example, you know, for us to see <clears throat> that they weren't fearful of any of this. And, uh, and so remember, they, yeah, they got put in jail. They were threatened to say we can't do it. But they said, hey, look, uh, we're going to do it. You decide if it's right to, to obey you, right, or to obey a God. Yeah. And we'll see them say that again. Uh, and then remember we closed last week with them coming back to uh, remember they came back to where was that verse 23 they went uh, went after that they went to their own companions like they came back to the church and it reported and told them everything that happened and remember they were rejoicing and they were praising God for it and they and they prayed <clears throat> and remember in their prayers <clears throat> look down at uh, verse 29 and, and 30 31 in particular remember what they were praying um they were giving God thanks for what he was doing. But what was, like, the biggest part of their prayer that we looked at last week? Maybe look at your notes or look at those couple of verses there. And even in that, I want to encourage you. <clears throat> I want to say uh, just a plug again for Wednesday nights, which I think uh, all of you come to Wednesday nights. Uh, but Wednesday night Bible study has been so good. I think it's sparked so much conversation and, and a lot of, uh, you know, roundtable dialogue because, you know, we have the book and people are reading ahead and stuff. And so uh, I want to encourage you to do that no matter if you have a MacArthur book in your hand or not. You know, just like, no, we finished at 31 last week. We're going to pick up next week at verse 32 and probably go through that next uh, section uh, so that you're, you know, you got some thoughts. I love when you guys come in with the thoughts and the, you know, the research and the homework. And uh, so anyways, just want to encourage us to, to keep doing that and, uh, and studying ahead in our own time. Uh, but how do they kind of end that, you know, last week what, what was it like what were they asking for in their prayers well in 29 and you're saying maybe speak your word with confidence don't let us get yeah careful. yeah let us keep moving forward. yeah verse 29 ends with confidence verse 31 says uh they were filled with the holy spirit and began to speak the word of god with boldness <clears throat> yeah. um yeah so i think we talked about that last week what a fitting prayer for us today like you were saying jim for the church in general, like give us more boldness, give us confidence uh, to, to speak to people and to, to tell people about the gospel. Well, remember too, when I think it was Brian that was here last week talking about verse 24, look, look at how they started their prayers. That really stuck with me. Like if we started yeah. our prayers this way, then I think it would be easier to ask for more boldness. Correct. Because yep. we would put God in perspective. Start with the holiness of yeah. God, yeah, and who he is for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, what they didn't pray for was protection or stuff yeah. like Plans, which would be the first thing I would have been yeah. for in this scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah. stop the opposition, please, please, please Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, Lord Flogged. Yeah. Humiliated. Yeah. yeah. They're not asking for any of that. Yeah. Amen. Uh, Jason, would you mind reading for us uh, verse 32 to 37? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the great grace 
Jesus upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Father, we come to you and we're grateful as I hear laying at your feet uh, that we can lay our prayer requests at your feet. And uh, as we look at the prayer here of, of uh, these disciples, this uh, early church here, I pray that you would grant us confidence in your word, boldness, and more knowledge and understanding of it so we can be better representatives for you. Uh, Lord, we just uh, ask for um, this, and we just ask that we would have one heart and one soul, as this church does here. Uh, we ask that we would be able to do life together and to care for one another and to forgive one another and to love one another, Lord, as, as we're called to do. So help us to better do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's really what we see here in these, you know, these closing verses here in chapter 4 is um, the tight-knit, you know, closeness of the family uh, of this church. You know, and a lot of people will refer to the Acts 2 church and the early church and <clears throat> talk about that. And so we really see what, you know, life was like for these, you know, these people who were in the beginning stages of this New Testament church. Um, you know, it says they were one, uh, one heart and one soul. It says none of them claimed anything was their own, but all things were common property. And we actually saw that already back in chapter 2, um, 44 and 45. It said all those who had believed together had all things in common. And they were selling their property um, and giving as anyone had a need. And so um, what, what do you see in that? You know, what, what is it that you see in that, uh, those two verses, you know, those couple places here in those verses? Well, definitely, you know, what gets me is one spirit and one soul. And for those who believe, we're in one heart and soul. Yeah. So basically, that's, uh, you know, when uh, when everything is done in the name or for the Father, you know, yep. or the gospel, everybody knows that there's only one way. There's no, you know, there, there's no two gospels. <clears throat> you know, sure. There's one gospel and that's it. So they were all in that movement and that, that strive together and that's what uh you know and this Good. is that you know nothing belonged to them so, so with it, that um that joe's pointing to what is it you know what does that lead to i guess in the thought of the, the like everything not being their own yeah, that they're, they're selling their possessions you know how does that what do you see in humbleness? that humbleness well and it wasn't about them it was their common right common purpose you know like they just put everything else aside and just had unity. And wasn't it just a chapter back where we were talking about that? And maybe that was two as well. Just that like-mindedness of mm -hmm. um, coming together. Yeah, continually. Mm -hmm. Breaking so bread, good. disciples teaching. Yeah, that would be the end of chapter two, I think. Yeah, in the next part of that section. Yeah, um, they're not being selfish, right? <clears throat> they're being selfless. They're considering others uh, more than their themselves. Uh, I think I've read that somewhere before, that that's how we're supposed to be. Um, you know, they were being gracious. They yeah. were being, uh, they weren't being forced or compelled to do this. Excuse me. Um, we'll talk about that maybe more in a minute, but, um, you know, they were being gracious, uh, towards one another. They were, they were, they received this amazing grace from God and they're, you know, portraying that and displaying that and pouring that out to other brothers and sisters around them. Um, and so, you know, maybe what kind of, what kind of application do we have in that? You know, uh, is there any, you know, how, how do you think the church, I put a capital C there, because how, how do you think the church does that today, you know, um, globally, just the church in general? And how do you think, you know, how are we doing at that? These can be, when I, these can be rhetorical questions, you know, questions to ask yourself in the mirror. How am I doing at this? Um, I'm not saying that you need to go sell your house and sell all your possessions and bring the money here and spread it out amongst everybody here. Uh, that's, that's not what we're saying. That's not the principle that we should derive out of this because um, everybody wasn't doing that and they weren't being told to do that. Um, that's kind of the, the key here, uh, you know, as, as we get to it. But um, I don't know, the status or the state of the church today, how do you think we're doing this generosity, this considering others 
you know, in, in assisting and helping others. Um, any thoughts on that? I think some churches do better than others, and I think some people do better than others. Hmm. And I think it comes in seasons, too. So maybe at Christmas everyone is very jolly and friendly and giving, you know, but or Sundays maybe you're jolly, friendly, and giving. You know, I just think that's a very big question, so it just depends. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of rhetorical, but, <clears throat> yeah, something to um, but contemplate. Ap- Application-wise, I think, um, you know, like you're saying, you're not asked to sell your house and bring all the money here, but I think if Yolanda ha- has a need for something and I can fill it, I should graciously want to help my sister. And so I think so. some basic application is that. If you yeah. if you have something that you can give and you can help, yeah. Why, yeah. you know, why not? Why yeah, it says that? there wasn't a needy person among <clears throat> them. You know what I mean? Like nobody was lacking anything. Because um, if you have resources, God, like you said, God gifts us. But not only does he gift us, but he blesses us in different ways. But those blessings aren't just for us to keep. Right. right. Those are for our resources that he gives us to help others as well. So Correct. Like Joe might be really good at plumbing or something, you know what I mean? But yeah. I'm really good at this, and Brooke's good at this. It's like, Don't well, start together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But together, like, but it we all to. bless each other. And I got a couple of scriptures that I think help in this that uh, that I like to for us to get to, because uh, I think you guys are on a you're on a good point here. You know that um, we are to to be fulfilling the needs and helping others uh, with the need that they have. If we can help, uh, and we should have the Holy Spirit prompting us maybe to do that. You know, and and like Jill said, those are the reasons that we've been blessed so much, uh, is so that we can be a blessing to other people. Um, and I find it interesting there, too, just in passing, in verse 33, it says, And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. So while they're being gracious, they're receiving more grace because they're out there uh, boldly presenting the gospel and, sh- and sharing, you know, the, the testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. What is that? That's the gospel. You know, and so... We know that God answered that prayer that they asked for. Remember the confidence, the boldness. Remember the place shook, and it said they were received the Holy Spirit. You know, were filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, and so we see that even here again in verse thirty-three that uh, they're doing that, and then they're receiving grace. Uh, and because when someone is gracious, and Jill's talked about being graciously helping other someone else in their need, I mean that is a display and an act of God's grace. God is being gracious to that person through you, right? And so. Um, you know, those are significant things uh, to, to consider. And I want us to kind of spend our majority of our time here. It flies. We've only got uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so I want to get to a couple of verses here to talk more about that. So let's just kind of finish these couple of verses in the narrative, and then we'll, we'll come back to that, a couple of verses there. Um, well, look, it says, No needy among them. They were selling proceeds of land and, and properties and giving it to the apostles uh, to distribute. And then look at verse 36 real quick. Uh, it says, now Joseph, a Levite, a Cyprian uh, birth. So um, I think Jason's version said from Cyprus. Uh, we'll talk about Cyprus later. Uh, that was a, a, an island in an area there. And uh, yeah, anyone ever heard of this person? He's a Levite, we see. So he's an Israelite. Correct. Is he the same Barnabas that travels with Peter? Is it Peter? With Paul. I think it's the same one. Yeah. So I think, because why is it that we're hearing, okay, uh, chapter two, the congregation shared life together. They did all this. Here we are again. Uh, They they were one heart, they were one mind. Nobody had a need because they all helped each other and they all gave. And then all of a sudden, it just pins point on one guy. Like, oh, and and this Joseph, this Barnabas. And so um, the apostles called him Barnabas, which I think is an awesome name. Look, it means son of encouragement. And we're going to see that uh, in Barnabas as we move forward. And I think oftentimes you see that's why someone's named here. If you remember our study back in Genesis, I'm thinking about uh, just remember the genealogies. And I tried to point out how it always goes to a specific name. It'll be like, you know, uh, Adam uh, had, I don't remember how many children, but he had many sons and daughters. And he lived to be, you know, 950 or whatever it was. um, and, And he had a son named Seth. It doesn't name all their sons and daughters. And it does that all the way down the line. It names one son. And the one son is the one they name. Why? Because you can track down the lineage through where the Messiah is going to come. 
So they don't trace all the other right, children right. In, in, uh, that they have, uh, but they go through that one. And so that person's named for a particular reason. Um, and so in this, I think the same thing that Barnabas is named here because uh, we're going we're gonna to learn more about him. Uh, when we get to chapter 12, I think, no, for that, uh, chapter 9 is Paul um, 13. I think 13 and 14 yeah. is the first mission trip that Paul has, and we're going we're gonna to meet um, Silas and Barnabas and, and these, these guys. Uh, but we'll see him mentioned throughout Acts. He's going to be a prominent uh, person, a prominent figure throughout this, this story. So I think this is just the way that you know, Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, introduces him here to us to say this is going to be the, uh, this Barnabas, who's the son of encouragement, later you're going to see he's encouraging, you know, and that he's a, a part of this. And here you notice that now you're talking about the genealogy. It doesn't really give a, a father's name, but it does give you a location, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, yep. Joseph, a Levite, but there's no parents, there's no name, but it gives you a location. So I guess they're using that as the reference point, right? Yeah, yeah, of who this is. And I think in giving the two names. Joseph, who is called Barnabas, right. you know, I mean, like they're making a point. Who is a Levite? You know, you know just to narrow down who this who this is. Yeah. Yeah, but I think in the in the Bible too, we see a lot of times that there's these uh, supporting roles <laughs> um, in people's in people's lives. Like you said, just about that son of encouragement. You know, I just think of Aaron was with Moses. So God's already put people in our lives that are going to help us through things that you know yeah. Paul doesn't know at this point what what's about to happen to him. Do you know what I mean? But God's already orchestrating things yeah. and letting Barnabas see all these how these people are acting in this early church yeah. and just being an example. And he's going to put yeah. them in place. We're seeing Barnabas is part of, yeah, like you said, that core like, church. He's with the apostles. He is one of the disciples. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's going to be a, a, a big thing um, as we see moving forward that, you know, he's going to be someone that we do focus in on some. Um, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's turn over there. Look at a couple verses here. Um, so it says, <clears throat> chapter ends there saying that this Barnabas owned a tract of land. He sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he's one of the ones who, who have done this. <clears throat> now, again, understand, these were, these were gracious acts that were put upon these people. Uh, this was not a requirement. I want us to understand this is not like, so. this isn't Socialism 101, um, again, that we should all go sell our property and bring it into, you know, into one big collective pool here, and we'll divvy it out to, to each as as needed. That's that's not the principle that's being taught here. Um, it wasn't a requirement. Everyone wasn't doing that, um, and we're going to find that out in the next chapter. Uh, but it was just that these people, it was laid upon their heart to be so generous and so gracious. And so, as we come to Second Corinthians nine. Uh, <clears throat> somebody want to read for us uh, verses 6 to 15? I'll read. 6 through 15, Corinthians 9. <clears throat> now this I say, he who has, he who has sowed sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who has sowed bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has proposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything you may have an abundant an abundance for every good deed as it is written he scattered abroad he gave to the poor his righteousness endures forever now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increasing the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. To where? Fifteen. Fifteen. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing through many thanksgiving 
to God because of the proof given by the ministry they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberty liberality of your contribution for them and to all while they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God and his indescribable gift. Good. Indescribable. Yep. Good, yeah. Thanks be to God for his <coughs> indescribable gift. And so the theme there we see is giving, right? In the heart of, of giver and the heart that God wants us to have in giving. But thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. God gives the most. He's, he's the giver behind all the giving. Uh, and so we are a, a reflection of that, and, and I think that's what we see uh, in our text here. Uh, but I've got a couple things just to point out here. Um, you know, in this text, verse 6 to 15, 2 Corinthians 9, there's just so much good stuff to this. Um, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, he doesn't like, the, you know, to, for us to give grudgingly or uh, under compulsion, I think is what Joe's uh, version said. Um, you know, that, that you're, uh, you know, I'm being forced, you know, a different kind of compulsion uh, in, a, in a different context, right? If we want to be compelled to speak the gospel that we can't but not do it, uh, this is like a compulsion of like, you're forcing me to do this. Uh, this is like gr- grudgingly, like, I know I got to do this. I'm just going to put this in the plate. I'm just going to give this burden to this person because I know I should and I have to. Um, it's like, you might as well not give it to them. You, yep. you know what? Keep Amen. keep your twenty dollars. Don't put it in the offering yeah, right. plate. Uh, that's not what the Lord wants. Uh, the Lord, in fact, actually wants much more than that, right? What, what is it that God wants? Everything Romans twelve wants one and two tell us. Yeah, you, your heart, your everything. your soul, your mind, your yeah. everything. Uh, you know, present your your body as a living sacrifice uh, that is you know good and acceptable and pleasing um, to to God. He wants all of you and he wants everything. Um, so he loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because he's a cheerful giver. He loves for people to be gracious. Why? Because he's gracious. He wants you to be merciful and forgiving. Why? Because he's merciful and forgiving. <laughs> like all these things are, are for us to do. And so verse 7 there you got that he loves a cheerful giver. Uh, verse 8 says that God shows grace towards you. So I think all these, this text just came to mind because this is so, like this just sums up, I think, what we just read in Acts. Uh, God shows grace towards you. That's why you should be gracious to other people and go sell something to, to give something to someone like they were doing. And, um, you know, they didn't have Zelle and, uh, you know, all these things to kind of give things. They would have to, like, kind of liquidate their assets and sell something to be able to give something to someone. Um, you know, but you see their grace being poured out, and that comes from the grace of God. Uh, you have twice here. Look at verse 11 and verse 13. Both say, uh, talk about this ministry and this, it's this ministry of giving. Uh, it's, and it's said a couple times, giving everything with liberality. Uh, I see liberality in verse 11. I see liberality in verse 13. What does liberality mean? What does Free, that mean? Freely. Freely. Okay, yeah, freely or generously. generously. Right, freely, generously. You're giving abundantly. Um, thinking of Ephesians 3.20, maybe it is. Um, now to him who is able to give exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Right, that that is God, and so He wants us to be giving like that. Uh, and so, how is it that we can do those things? You know, we give liberality in this ministry. He's saying it's a ministry that you're giving generously to God's work and to help other people. And He says in that, look at what it leads to. It produces thanksgiving to God. The liberality of your contribution to them all, uh, you know, does this. And so, right there in verse 11 and verse 13. Uh, you know, we see that, that it leads to thanksgiving to God. Because why? Who should, why should we be giving thanks to God to, that we can give generously to other people? That's a one-track thing. I mean, God gives to you, and then if you give from what God gives to you and give to somebody else, it's like, like you, you're talking about the blessings. The blessings don't come to you. They come through you. So God blesses you with some, a brand new wardrobe and your neighbor doesn't have any clothes, you know, it, it should be a righteous thing, it should be a willing thing to say, hey, you know, I just got this. Because most people would keep it, maybe for a rainy day, if I ever need parents to paint, I'm just giving you an example, then greed kind of comes in, you know what I'm saying? If I give you something, it's like the middleman. 
here, give this to Craig, a thousand dollars. Oh, Joe gave me five hundred bucks here for you. I'm saying, but you know, that's gonna be a good segue that. into chapter five. Yeah. We'll see. Everything, every gift comes from God. Yeah. Is the yeah. Shape, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, everything yeah. we have is His. Really, yeah. He's saying, more you give out, the more you get back. Well, Sometimes, and, and we're yeah. doing His work too. We He. I agree with you, Brooke, in the yeah. sense of not material-wise, I guess. Right. Sometimes material, money. yeah, you may get that back. It's not but you're going to get it back in heaven yeah. and above and beyond, uh, you know, to that. And, and that. and again, in verse 14, there's another one. It says, the surpassing grace of God is in you. If the grace of God is in you, you will give generously. You will be a part of this ministry. You will be a cheerful giver. You will give thanks to God. And knowing that all that works together, that's what it's supposed to look like. Um, and I think it's sacrificial. Like I feel, feel like yes. we're missing that part. Like I think of your mom. Your mom is like the most generous. She just can't love you more. She can't love our family more. She would give till she had nothing because. And it, so it shows. Yeah. It just shows the heart. Going back to what the Bible always goes back to, is your heart. You know what yeah. I mean. And God knows our heart. And when we act gracious and we give and we show and we act like Him, we're more Christ-like. And you know what I mean? Like it yeah. all just makes sense. And so I just think of a mother's love because Yeah. And and we just and it's a great example and we just we just struggle with it so much. And I mean to the point I mean I could really uh, you know gut punch to myself, but I think to all of us to think of, you know, I think of other um, believers that I've heard of testimony of um, you know, learning to live uh, when we talk about doing budgets and we talk about living within your means, uh, I mean, there's there's men that I know of who, you know, wrote books and the proceeds of their books, uh, you know, they could have made a lot of money. But before they even wrote the book or sold the book or did any of these things, they, they made a point, you know, them with their wives uh, to say, here's what, here's where we can live and we yeah. can live within this. And any surplus is going to be given away. Uh, and, and, you know, so they'll sell these books and they'll make lots of money and they give it, you know, to, to missionaries, they give it to the church, they give it to, you know, people in need. And I just get that as an example to say, how can we do this in a practical application would be, yeah, maybe you look at your yearly budget or however you do it and see, uh, we don't need to keep living at 99% of the money that we make. Right. So when I make a hundred dollars a week, I live on $100 a week. If I make $500 a week, you know what I typically do? I live on $500 a week. Uh, and, and I see nods and smiles because that's who we are. Well, what if you decide, okay, I could bump that up a little bit and I could live on, I could live on 250 bucks a month really well. Uh, and I'm making 350 so I can give that away. Um, that's just a different mindset. And I bring that up to us to say, like, I don't, better on you. If you're doing that, and God bless you, uh, if you have the discipline and can do that, because it's difficult. And what I'm saying to you is, what we see here is that's what these people do. They know they have much more than they need, and they're giving it away to other people who they see don't have as much. Uh, and that's the significance that we see here. And I, I think of um, Luke 6:38. Jesus says, uh, "Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken over." You know, shake it together, running over. Uh, I'm running out of time as I look at it. Uh, but that's the picture here. Like, you've got this bucket, you know, and you're filling it with whatever. You're filling it with grain, and you're just, you're trying to get more in there, you know, so you're patting it down. You're shaking around. You're boom, 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 banging on the ground, you know, to put more in there. Like, th he's saying that's how it will be given to you. Um, press down, shake it together, and running over. For by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Uh, so we know that God is you know, a gracious giver and a generous giver. So back to Brooke's point, why would we not be gracious and generous knowing that he's the giver of all things and can totally replenish our supply uh, and give us, you know, he's going to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, Paul says, I think in Philippians. Um, so your generosity is evidence of God's grace upon you. It's evidence that you've received God's grace. It's evidence that you've been saved. It's fruit of of, of the spirit in your life, uh, a part of that is how you give and how you, you do these things. So, um, and you know, as, as we segue again into, we won't do it today because we're out of time. As we segue now into chapter five next week, Lord willing, put it out there to say, God loves a cheerful giver, but what about an uncheerful giver? What about a person who doesn't give with the right heart and the right motive? And 
and that's going to be what we're going to see. It is easier for a camel to jump through an eye of a needle. Yeah. That's yeah. what I think about. Yeah, for a rich man's going to the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's, again, that's a good it is a good verse. And, again, it's not to condemn wealth. Remember, it's not that they're saying, the Bible doesn't say you can't be wealthy. The Bible doesn't say you have to go sell all your things and give it to the poor. The but remember, with the heart of this whole thing, it's just that it's about our heart of being generous and gracious. Uh, because God is gracious and God is generous. And he calls us, you guys, as, as that Second Corinthians 9 talks about, God loves a cheerful giver. I mean, we can go to many other places, uh, but God calls us when we are believers. It's a command for us to give generously to his kingdom and to the work of his kingdom. The work of his kingdom is progressed by the work of the local church that you're in, by the work of global churches, by the work of missionaries that are supported that way. And it's done by, you know, you being hands and feet, obviously, out there helping people that you help, you know, and, and doing the things, that, assisting people that you can assist. And so, well, and I think when the whole church, I was just thinking of Martha because she's texting, she's great, she's getting a ride. Eddie's going to drop her off, and somebody could give her a ride home. Just great. Her right there, um, because we were talking about her before, but I just think of her and her struggles this year, and I think it's just been a good picture because it's not a burden for just one person to take care of her. It's been all of us stepping in, and so if everybody did a little, yeah, you know, good. Been, which points to points to what you saw that. here yeah, today, because yeah. we gotta we I'm gotta saying. stop. But yeah, you're bringing us back to yeah. the overall view of what we saw in these verses. Is uh, you know that we keep coming back to is that's what we saw in this this church in these and early believers. Fruit. You see the heart of them loving one another, mm -hmm. and and that in their love was so good, it says nobody had need. Can we say that about our church? Can we say that about the church? Can we say that about our own family? Like, you know, is there no need? So, you know, it's it can be convicting, but it should be encouraging, too, as I think about Barnabas, right? We want to encourage one another to say, yeah, God loves a cheerful giver. So uh, he says in there, let each person give what God's put on their heart. I have one more thing. Sorry, I know we're out of time. But, Jen, when you were asking, like, we want more fire, but I think when you do things like this and you give, yeah. you get the fire, like, you'll see, like, how, the, you know, yeah. well, that, doing more yeah. gives you the fire. I believe <laughs> so. That's, that, that's self-control. Yeah. When that, you pray for others, you think about others. We've talked about this a lot. Daniel, we talked about this a lot. Blessing someone else is a lot of application. Your fire. Thinking like, about others, true. blessing others, praying for others, those things will greatly change you and change your heart and yeah. that's what God is telling you to do yeah. because it greatly changes your heart it affects yeah. you when you think about other people more than you think about yourself and when you pray for other people more than you pray about yourself let them pray for me I'm going to pray for you <laughs> uh, you know that's the mentality you know that, that all those things do change your heart and that's the goal Lord we love you thank you for this day thank you for the time um, we know that we cannot redeem it. And so, Lord, uh, the time that has passed is gone. Help us as we move forward now to encourage one another, to stir one another up into love and to good deeds, that we would be generous and gracious towards one another and towards those around us that you put around us. And, uh, Lord, that your work would be continued here um, in First Baptist in, in Isla Mirada and in all the other churches that preach the gospel here. Uh, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the great provider. And so we uh, know that you will supply uh, in accordance to your to your will, all our needs in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.